Hello, I'm here for our next ARC Power User Conversation. This is our in-depth deep dives into some of the people who are shaping uh, ARC and adding capabilities to our platform. Many of you may have noticed that we have introduced a set of climate risk tools, including the ability to create physical climate risk assessments, physical assessments of risk for projects around uh, across the United States. And I, I'm here with Albert Slap, the president and co-founder of Coastal Risk Consulting, and one and, and the, the passion point and brainchild of the Risk Footprint Report, which you can now access within ARC. So we're here today to learn a little bit about Albert, about Coastal Risk, about the Risk Footprint Report that is now available to ARC users. And so we want to start by, first, I want to start by welcoming Albert and, and, to, and, 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 and appreciating his time to have a conversation about ARC and about what we can now do in the platform. I want to start by stepping back. So Albert, who are you? What is the origin and mission of Coastal Risk Consulting? Why, why are you in this line of business? And what is, what is your company trying to do? Well, first, Chris, thanks for having me on. I, I really appreciate it and uh, looking forward to uh, helping the ARC users uh, better understand their uh, the risk to their properties. So we're, we're a startup company located in Boca Raton, Florida, and we've been around for four or five years. Uh, the, the, the mission of the company is to excel, help companies, individuals, and uh, businesses and governments accelerate their resilience. We're not an advocacy group. We're not a nonprofit. Uh, we're a pure science-based shop uh, that has developed a, a risk assessment tool in the Amazon cloud that can be accessed uh, and now through the ARC platform and through riskfootprint.com. Um, so my background is... Um, I guess you would say I'm a little gray and grizzled for your typical startup entrepreneur. Uh, I was a, an environmental law professor and an environmental lawyer for 40 years until I retired in late 2014. So the idea of practicing environmental law and having an environmental risk assessment tool is not you know, that you know, far afield really because uh, my practice, which was uh, on behalf of mostly environmental groups, uh, uh, water keeper type groups uh, and, and the like, uh, focused on trying to uh, stop uh, pollution and, and to improve the environment. Uh, and that's sort of what we're trying to do here with the risk footprint tool. That's, that's, that's great. Tell, me, tell us a little bit about your the, the, the brain trust that makes risk, risk footprint work. Obviously, this stems out of your own passion, your own professional background, but it's not just you behind the scenes. You, you've got a team who are who are pulling together data from all sorts of sources. Can you say just a little bit about that, that part of the, of the organization? Yes. So my co-founders uh, were two leading climate scientists, uh, Dr. Leonard Berry, who uh, is an emeritus professor at Florida International University. Uh, he is a world-renowned uh, climate scientist. Uh, he was a lead author for Southeastern United States and the Caribbean for the third national climate assessment. And for 20 plus years, he ran the Center for Environmental Studies uh, out of Florida Atlantic University, but it was a Florida statewide uh, center. And uh, also Dr. Brian Soden, who is a professor at the uh, prestigious University of Miami Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. He also uh, was the lead author of the first uh, UN IPCC report that uh, uh, won the Nobel Prize with Vice President Al Gore. So he shared the Nobel Prize with Vice President Gore. Uh, and the original vision uh, was to to help individuals, businesses, and government rapidly assess their environmental and climate risks using an online tool. Um, clearly, engineering companies, A&E companies, have and have had the capability of doing this kind of work for large corporations and large cities, and they've been doing this for some time. 
What hasn't been available is a fast, affordable, and accurate tool that would allow uh, companies that need to act and, and assess risk much more quickly than engaging with an A&E firm to do manually what now can be done in seconds digitally. And I will give a plug to, to ARC and Green Building Council. Great, awesome. So let's let's talk a little bit about the big picture. So uh, obviously anybody who's paying attention to this knows that the focus on physical risk has been increasing year over year. And a, a, as we've seen with recent work by the, the, the Securities and Exchange Commission or the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures or other institutional investors, there is a lot of interest in physical risk right now. Why? What's, what's driving these changes? What's, what, what is that about right now? Well, it, it's, it's a little complex. There's, there, to me, there's, there's uh, two main buckets. Uh, one bucket is th those uh, investment funds, the ESG type funds, environmental, social government, and there's 40, 60 trillion dollars of, of funds that um, uh, consider themselves green uh, in an ESG uh, context. And there's pressure in the EU and requirements and now regulations coming out in the EU to increase transparency and in reporting on, is it real or is it greenwashing for the ESG type reporting? And that has evolved from, I call it the two-sided coin. The one side is how green is my building or what's my building or my portfolio of assets doing to the planet? That's a, you know, CO2 emissions, uh, carbon footprint. And that's evolved and migrated to a second part, which is really coming out of the uh, PR, UNPRI and the Task Force for Climate uh, Disclosure, which is, okay, you've told us what your assets are doing to the planet. Now tell us what the planet's doing to your assets and what does that mean financially and is it material in the context of the type of financial disclosures that the SEC here in the United States would, would consider that investors ought to know. So there's, there's that bucket. Then there's a second bucket. And the second bucket is equity owners, owners and operators of buildings. Uh, I'm going to buy a building. I, I'm going to finance it. I'm a bank. I'm going to lend money on a building. Uh, I'm going to operate a building. I have to understand not only is the roof still competent, is the MEP mechanical electrical plumbing systems, you know, I have a property condition assessment, but what about the physical climate risks, everything from floods, natural hazards, extreme weather, and future climate risks? The, the state of due diligence, both for homeowners and for commercial, is woefully behind the times, and pretty much everybody knows that. So when you do get an ESA, environmental site assessment, when you get a, a property condition assessment, a PCA, it's not climate informed. And this is a buzzword that I'm going to probably tell, say it now. It, uh, most of the listeners have never heard this before, but it's coming. Climate-informed due diligence. It's just not there because there hasn't been a tool like Risk Footprint that goes down into the weeds to quantify. The, the, the first bucket that we talked about, this reporting of what you're doing to the planet, and perhaps at a high level, what the planet's doing, uh, you know, with the uh, uh, RCP uh, scenarios and scenario analysis of what happens if, you know, the temperatures of the planet go up a, a certain amount. That's qualitative. Those are typically qualitative scores and not quantitative scores. But if you get the bad news, about a particular asset or groups of assets that might be in a coastal zone, a wildfire, tornado alley, um, they could be in uh, earthquake zones, and you are concentrated so that the, it, the financial impacts on your company could be quite serious. An investor or 
the owner is going to say, okay, that's the bad news. What do I do next? In order to encompass what I do next about a particular property or group of properties, you need quantification and the risk footprint starts you down that road of quantification. And then you go to things like value at risk studies and, and other things that might involve people actually going on the site. So the risk footprint and our value at risk studies are desktop you know, they're in the cloud. So I call them desktop because nobody has to go on the site and they're available very, very quickly. But eventually when you are answering the question of what do I do next to make my building property safer, more sustainable and resilient, you have to go down that and then eventually, and I think it's happening now, the regulatory agencies are going to realize that that level of granularity and that level of disclosure must accompany the carbon footprint and the high level qualitative information that you would get on GRES or some of those other sites. Great, awesome. Let's let's so that there's a lot of motivation and a lot of moving parts. And so why don't we dive a little deeper into what you actually package in that risk in that risk footprint report? So uh, as we're going to show folks in a few minutes, we are you're able to go from an address to a boundary and and, and both and and on within that boundary, you get a, a range of analytics, of quantitative analytics. Can you can you speak to a little of the the the, the nature of that information that comes back? We're going to see it in a few minutes, but I'd love to have your perspective on on what you roll together to per, into that into that risk footprint report itself. Okay, so on the cover page of the risk footprint report is a restatement of the uh, sp of, of a row in the spreadsheet. So. Typically, people will, um, they, they can buy risk footprints uh, from us or, or on ARC, uh, cheaper on ARC, uh, a la carte. But we also have subscribers who upload large spreadsheets of properties that are processed by us in a batch way. And then it's on their uh, subscription, their dashboard subscription, so they can use the system themselves. The spreadsheet of risk scores, and there's 14, currently 14 columns of risk, which I'll go over, is qualitative. But then the report is quantitative, and you're getting both the, the spreadsheet results, the qualitative results, and the quantitative results. The other thing that the spreadsheet does is it looks out a half a, in a half a mile radius outside the footprint of the property of the property boundary. And we do that because of ingress and egress and other market uh, factors. And I think I believe we're the only one that's doing this in an automated way. And why do we do it? We do this because the clients, uh, typically a commercial enterprise, if they're looking to buy a building or even if it's a greenfield site, uh, uh, you know, uh, their bank or their insurance company is really only looking at the building footprint. But when they want to understand walkability, if they want to understand how uh, is the parking lot going to get flooded, uh, how do my supply trucks get in and out, you have to go out a little wider. But in, in, in the ARC framework, people are putting in addresses of known buildings in a Google Maps interface. So if, it's, if it geocodes in Google Maps, it's going to work in ARC. But there's actually four ways that you can put uh, a, a property in. You can use an address. You can use a latitude and longitude. We have a, a hand-drawn draw, drawing tool for our subscribers. So if they're putting lots together in a greenfield that don't have doesn't have an address yet, because they're putting three or four lots together, or it's a farm, uh, and they're buying part of a farm, uh, then you can hand draw that. And then the fourth way to get it in is just a common name like Aventura Mall. So if you were to go to Google Maps and you don't know the address of the Aventura Mall and you put Aventura Mall in there, it's gonna show up as a property boundary with an API that we have from a boundary layer vendor. And this is 
boundary uh, uh, property boundaries from the recorder of deeds in every county in, in the United States. Uh, but if, you know, it's about 95% effective, uh, but if it's not, then again, you have latitude and longitude and you have a hand, hand drawing tool that you can use. So there's 14 columns of risk, an aggregate score, heavy rainfall, riverine, uh, storm surge, FEMA, tsunami, uh, wildfire, earthquake, um, and uh, wildfire, earthquake, tornado, and wind. And then you have four future, <laughs> four future, I hope by this time I remember them. And then you have four future 2050 risks, tide, tide flooding and sea level rise, future extreme heat, future extreme rainfall, and future risk of drought. Wow. So uh, as you're going through that, you you also you 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 designate them as as low, medium, or high. Uh, it, well, folks are going to see that in the in the in the report we show in a few minutes. What what how would how should they understand those divisions? Because obviously you have quantitative information flowing in on each of those risk factors, and then you're doing a an, a categorization of that. How should they understand the low, medium, and high designations they'll see on their report? Well, typically. Uh, the the qualitative risk score from the spreadsheet is mostly for a portfolio analysis. So um, ARC users or others who have portfolios of properties, once it's exported, once we batch score the portfolio and then export it back to the client, uh, because it's in an Excel spreadsheet, you can make uh, pie charts, you can make bar graphs, so that as this goes up to the C-suite, they can say, uh, they could ask a question, what percentage of my portfolio is in an earthquake zone, high, high, high red zone for earthquakes? What percentage of my portfolio is in the red zone for wildfire? What percentage of my portfolio has uh, extreme tide flooding, sea level rise, or whatever. And then if they have hundreds of properties, which or even thousands, which some of our clients do, then just focus on the red zone properties uh, for, you, you don't have to necessarily, from a budgetary standpoint, uh, necessarily pay attention to the green or the yellow, and then you can pay attention to the red zone properties then the risk footprint report is going to give you the quantification of those risks, whether it's tornado, uh, earthquake, or flooding. And then you can go even further to look at value at risk. Is, there a, is this a very important property to us from a profitability standpoint? Is it a very expensive property? Is there a lot of value at risk if there's flooding? How long would it be out of service? Do we have enough insurance? And by the way, we don't sell insurance. We don't sell any products. We're not connected to any other large organization that might create any conflicts of interest. So when people get information from us and we're there with advisory services to help them with the what's next, it's it's completely conflict free. We don't, you know, we're not trying to sell them anything. We're just trying to help them figure out, again, how to make their property safer, more sustainable, and resilient. Awesome. Well, maybe, uh, Albert, I think it's time to show people how they actually access these tools. So I'm going to share my screen for a second, and I'm sure you have more to say when, we, when we're, when we're going to, I'm going to have the, the report up there in a second. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and I will then give folks a tiny bit of a guided tour for how to, a, a very brief guided tour for how to access these services. So what, what we can see on my screen right now is the ARC landing page. And for those of you who, I mean, maybe you're intrigued by everything that Albert said, I would, the first place I would direct you is up to the article section. You're gonna see a, a, a blog from me on new tools allow ARC projects to understand physical risk. You'll see the, the risk footprint logo. You'll see a little bit of motivation and then a few screenshots from 
the risk footprint report for our very own office in Washington, DC, along with a step-by-step -step guide on how to do what I'm about to show you. <laughs> so this is the place to go if you'd like more information on how to do this. So the first thing you do, as with everything in ARC, is log into the system. And once you log in, I'll, I'll actually jump over to an individual project, save us a second, so you can log into the, the, the system. And you'll find, you'll go to your projects, and then what you're going to find for every project in ARC is a, is a set of tools. So under, so I'll, I'll take you there for a second to make sure you know what you're doing. So obviously when you land in ARC, you'll see this view, you'll go to projects, and we'll go to a project together right here. If you haven't logged into ARC in the last week or two, you will find some new stuff. You're going to see climate risk on the left-hand side under project tools. You'll also see financial models, re-entry, and lead certifications down there. So from the point of view of someone who is interested in these in physical risk assessment, we're going to click on climate risk together, and we're going to find some options. And so if you've never done a risk footprint report, this is going to say no. And what we're trying to, what we're trying to present to you here is that when folks talk about climate risk, we're often looking at our greenhouse gas exposure, and which one way to assess that is your our carbon score. We're often talking about your progress toward electrification. What fraction of your energy are you getting from electricity? And as Albert uh, clearly described, we are worried about your physical, your exposure to physical risks, whether that's sea level rise, storm surge, flood, uh, extreme temperatures. If you, if, you if you would like a report, the way to get one is to create a report right here. You'll hit this button. You will confirm your location. In this case, as, as Albert says, this is queuing off an address. Um, as folks who use ARC regularly know, this address can be the product of putting in a latitude and longitude. It, anything that Google will recognize can be turned into an address. You confirm that you are going to share this project location with Albert and his team. So you're accepting Albert's terms of service. And then you'll hit create. This will take you to a payment page. And once you've hit, once you've completed that transaction, you will be sent back to your past reports section. In this section, it'll say pending, um, as the, the risk footprint team will now be at work creating a report for that location. When it's complete, that report will be uploaded and connected to ARC, and you will see this download link appear here. You'll also receive an email letting you know that the that your order has been completed. Once you, when you go to upload or to open this link, it'll open a document. This is the one that that Albert has been explaining to us. You'll see it, it, it clearly titled Risk Footprint. You'll see it designates the location. In this case, it's 2099 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest DC, which is which is our office right about here. And, and you'll see this is the grid that Albert has been telling you about. These are the, the columns represent current risks and then the set of 2050 risks that Albert described earlier along with the color coding and the designations. And so as we go through this report, you'll see that uh, in addition to Albert welcoming you to have this information, <laughs> you will see some uh, page by page maps and information. What I really love about the report is that in addition to these maps with that, that are clearly documented from the underlying sources, whether it's FEMA or whether it's their other partners, you'll see that kind of information and then roll it up to a, a dashboard with these essentially speedometers or these dials to give you a sense about the, about the impacts that are most pertinent to this project. Albert, anything you might want to add as, as I skim through the report to highlight things you said earlier? No, uh, in the, in the uh, first couple, if, it, if there's no pixels that have shown up, if you want to just go back up to page three for a second. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, pluvial or heavy rainfall risk. There's no um, blue uh, pixels. So this is no risk for heavy rainfall, which uh, is based on uh, the best satellite flood maps uh, that we've been able to obtain that are embedded in the system. Uh, and just remember that the FEMA uh, flood zone maps, which has been the way that people in commercial real estate for 40 years have basically identified their risk. The FEMA maps don't include heavy rainfall flooding. They don't include uh, tides, tidal flooding, sea level rise, climate change. Uh, they don't, they're not really uh, that much in sync with the NOAA storm surge. So we're trying to give you uh, an unbiased 
holistic look at risk. So in this case, it doesn't show any pixels, so there's no risk. Poor drainage hotspots, no, no pixels, no risk, uh, no fluvial. So you're in a FEMA X zone, which is the lowest risk flood zone that FEMA has. So that, you know, you're building where you are. You go back up to the meters for a second. Uh, so, so the building that you're in doesn't have a lot of flood risk and, and that's fine. There's a lot of uh, areas in DC down by the tidal basin that are already going underwater. So, you know, you're at higher elevation where you are and it's safer. Uh, page five, which we're looking at now, uh, provides meters uh, for natural hazard risks and climate change. But let's just stay in this view for a moment uh, for the future climate change impacts. Uh, we use a very sophisticated system that has been accepted by PRI and TCFD. It has been used in PRI reporting in 2020 and in 2021. And why is this different than sort of your typical scenario, RCP scenario modeling? This uses, uh, the technology that's behind this uses a meta-analysis of more than 30 climate studies using the RCPs uh, to look out to 2050 and to determine based on building science thresholds the materiality and, act, and, and it makes it more actionable. So under each one of these uh, meters, there's some text, and I wanna just reference the text if I can. So with regard to extreme heat, it says more than 75% of the models are predicting a 20% increase in cooling degree days. Well, let's just stop there. Uh, if this is an older building with older chillers that uh, somebody was buying, Chris, and uh, in the property condition assessment, the property condition assessor said the remaining useful life of the chillers is five years, let's just say. Uh, the, the buyer and the new equity owners are going to say to themselves, wow, not only do the chillers only have five more years of remaining useful life, but the risk footprint model is telling us that there's going to be a 20% increase in cooling degree days between now and 2050, we have to have a plan to really make our cooling system much more efficient or our profit isn't going to be what we think our profit's going to be to keep the building cooled at the appropriate levels. So what these meters do, and with extreme rainfall, it says you know the models are predicting a 20% increase in the number of five-year or greater precipitation events or uh, predicting a 5% increase in drought months. So you have a, a high, a moderate, and a low 2050 future climate risk tied back to building science thresholds that are meaningful, we have been told, that they're meaningful and actionable in a planning approach to building owners and operators as opposed to just a sort of academic uh, analysis that uh, DC is a hot place and it's getting hotter. Okay, it's a hot place and it's getting hotter, but how does that relate to cooling degree days and my profitability? And that's why we think that this is more valuable than what else is out there right now, because we're trying to tie it back in our model to the these building science thresholds. Great, that makes a lot of sense. And and one of the other things to as you base, uh, one thing that I value about this report, Albert, is one of the nice things, obviously, as you continue through this report, um, it's it, we're not a coastal area, so some of these things are not there. But I, I actually really appreciate how well documented your sources and methods are. You, even though there is a lot of stuff coming together, you, you and your team are very clear about where you're getting this information from. And obviously, you're passing it through your own proprietary algorithms, but your um, the way you're doing this is, is very nicely documented. So people may want to know, hey, wh where is some of this data com coming from? And, and you, you do a good job of, of, of being very specific, which I know that our users appreciate. They're always asking these questions <laughs> for transparency. So uh, I, I, let me maybe to kind of bring start to bring us to a, 
to a to a point to a close. How can how looking forward? Uh, maybe I, since I know part of your business is is uh, maybe not predicting the future, but scenarios of the future. What do you see as scenarios of the future for how this kind of technology, the assessment of physical risk? may evolve in the coming years or how the use of this technology are, are likely to change for uh, the folks who own and manage property. What, what are your expectations looking out a year or two or three in the future? What, what do you see happening in the industry? Well, I think, uh, again, you go back to sort of the buckets of reporting and uh, also the due diligence uh, bucket. So in the reporting bucket, obviously the big thing that people are keeping their eye on is the SEC and what the SEC is going to do in terms of climate disclosures and physical risk. And will they go and and require uh, not only the high level qualitative, but um, down in the weeds of what's happening to physical assets that are material to the profitability of the company? And what are they doing about the risks? And the question is, you know, are they going to go that far? And how fast are they going to do that? That's a big issue on the reporting side in the United States. On the due diligence side, um, that's changing. There's a, an ASTM committee that's looking at this, uh, but the I, I believe that that ASTM committee uh, is 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 moving forward. But I think that the industry is going to adopt climate. Uh, informed uh, environmental site assessment phase ones and property condition assessments much more quickly because it's just the right thing to do. And uh, the early adopters are clients of our company that kind of get it and they want to be the ones that are not left standing when the music stops uh, uh, are, are using this and they're not waiting for an ASTM standard uh, to come out. Uh, one of our clients said something uh, funny, sort of tongue in cheek that I, I like to tell people. He said, you know, Albert, your risk footprint reports helps get us get as close to the hot market as possible without getting our feet wet, <laughs> you know, metaphorically getting your feet wet. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that. Um, but one other one last thing uh, to about how these are going to change. Uh, so right now we have 14 columns of risk. Uh, the next column of risk is going to be community resilience. And we're going to add that column of risk in the next uh, month or so. And the reason that we're going to do that is that commercial real estate wants to know not only risk to the building footprint, not only to the parking lot and ingress and egress. But does, and I get back to the, the tongue in cheek metaphor, but does the community have the political will and the wherewithal to keep the streets dry and the lights on? And I mean, look, we just saw what, I have a, I have a, a stepdaughter in Jackson, Mississippi. It, it's like, I, 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 it's it's like the biblical story of Job. What is what has happened to those poor people in Jackson, Mississippi? They just got hit by a tornado. In after the freeze, after everything else that they've been through, she was without electricity for two weeks in the freeze, without potable water for a month. And then yesterday, the tornadoes hit and knocked a tree down on her street, and the power went out again. Yes. I mean, it's just so. If you were to say. I have nothing against Jackson, Mississippi, but if you were to say, I want to invest in a commercial building or build something or a big box store in Jackson, Mississippi, you would have to think twice about the, the, the ability, the resilience, lack of resilience of, of that city. And so each city, uh, and you would say something different about Miami Beach and Miami, they're leading the, the charge on resilience. Uh, but I think that commercial real estate is looking at the wherewithal uh, to, of the infrastructure to sustain their businesses, because obviously every business needs a, a, a well-working in public infrastructure. So we want the buildings to be well-working, safe, sustainable, and resilient, but the surrounding community also has to be making strides 
and picking up their oar and everybody's rowing in the same direction. So we're going to add community resilience. We're going to be adding additional rows of, of risk as we vet scientifically the databases that are behind them. Just because there's a database for landslides, for example, doesn't mean we're going to pick it up because our scientists need to really study the different databases and understand if they're legit. If they're not legit, we're not putting them in. That's, that's great. Well, we are excited to be to partner with you so that as you make those improvements, uh, ARC users will be able to get up to, to in, 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 in months or years as they go forward to continue to update those reports based on more recent information. And so I, I, I really appreciate your time today. I think we've given people a lot to think about. We, we have told them a bit about you and who, who you are as a partner. We have told them a bit about why they need this information. We've told them how to get it on ARC, and we've given them a bit of a preview as to what they can get. We've also given them a chance, as you just did, looking ahead as that this is, this is a milestone for us, but it's only one step in this broader evolution of your product and, and the kinds of insights you're going to provide. So with that, any closing thoughts for folks as, they, as, we, as we leave them for today? Hopefully, they'll go off and give this a try on ARC and, and reach out to you for, for more information. No, the only thing that I would say is that if you are an ARC user for a new construction, ARC, uh, you know, lead or rely, but you have a portfolio and you contact us, we will give you the 10% discount, the US Green Building Council uh, on processing the discount on processing your portfolio or setting you up as a subscriber. So that would carry over. It's not just on the a la carte and we'll be happy to extend that to your members. Great, that's really generous. We appreciate that. We'll make sure that people know about that. So with that, we'll close it for today. We, we hope that we, we will provide in the, in the notes below this video, we will provide contact information for myself and most importantly for Albert and his team. So if you wanna get in touch with them directly with any questions or you need their help um, understanding what to do with this information, they are there for you. And so with that, we'll close the program. We'll say thank you for your time and we'll hope to see you around ARC. Thank you very much. Yeah.